Yeah, thank you, Thomas. Um, since uh, Christoph Badram is here, I humbly uh, hand over the, the honors and the title back to him. <laughs> uh, I remember very well when we did this for the first time in Hamburg, and um, it's an interesting format, and you will see it here from our little setup that we have a clock running, uh, basically ticking. Each speaker is allocated time. Um, we are debating in two rounds. Um, so. Each of them is invited to have opening opinions, uh, definitely taking sides in the, in, in, in the issue we are, we are talking about. Um, then in the second round, rebutting those first initial arguments. Um, in the third round, we are opening this thing up to you. Um, and there are many people here who are uh, well acquainted with the issue. And even those who are not are invited to ask questions. And we uh, try to answer them. And then on the final round, we have another few minutes to sum up, to make the case. What we're doing differently here, and not this time, what we usually do, we have a vote on whether you like it or not. But this time, I guess we'll just have the arguments. And I will read from your faces where you are. And I'll give you an opinion later. So our, our issue is, is China's growing military a threat to Asia. Now, um, as always such sharp pointed questions are probably not fitting to reality and uh, reality is a little bit more than yours. One minute, I have to step out. Oh yeah, sure. Okay, he's pivoting back from the stage. <laughs> um, um, it's, uh, there are usually those, those questions are sort of a little bit overly pointed for the, for the simple reason to get a sharper uh, argument out of this. And this is why we um, decided to ask the panelists to debate, is China's growing military a threat to Asia? Now, we can talk what growing is. We can talk about what threat is. We can talk about what Asia is, what interests are. This is what we're going to do. Um, I am still waiting for, uh, you know, the Americans pivoted to Asia. And now uh, Kurt Volker, who is actually a transatlanticist and, um, and um, a NATO guy, has his first Asian experience today on stage. So. Uh, he's probably needing more, more arguments. Um, Colonel, Colonel Lu Yin <laughs> is uh, coming from Beijing uh, to debate this. Uh, she has a lot of experience in academics and in military science, uh, in strategy. You are I'm slowing this down. I guess we're simply starting the argument because it should be actually heard from him. I can make all the cases myself, but I shouldn't. Um, I guess we're simply starting. Um, and reversing the order, um, Colonel Liu is uh, making the case that China's growing military is not a threat to Asia. So please. So, from me, you myself, start. OK. Should it's we irregular. start? Does anybody know where Kurt Volker went? <laughs> Self-introduction, maybe, first. It's a key point for China. OK. Uh, yeah, he's, he's coming. coming. Okay. Yeah. It's OK. You, you start. Yeah. Please, go ahead. Oh, should we, yeah, should should we wait for him? Yeah. I, I think it should be He was uh, to supposed to yeah. start, so could you OK. I hope you're. I just, I'm ready. I just talked and talked, and we're <laughs> waiting a, for you to come I, I knew you could handle that. And thank now, you. Please fill us with some <laughs> Thank you. you go um, well, let me first say thank you for inviting me here. Uh, it is a pleasure to be uh, Somebody should here start and have, running the clock. It's a pleasure to be here and have the opportunity to uh, address this issue. And let me first say, uh, I'm not going to give you a flat, uh, yes, China's growing military is a threat. Uh, I think it's a risk, and I think it's something that we need to pay close attention to. And I want to go over some of the, um, the factors that go behind that. Um, but first, let me say that I think we can all be very impressed with China's development. It's economic development. It's lifting millions of people out of poverty, the creation of a middle class that is larger than the population of most countries, its emphasis on education, its emphasis on health, and its potential as a great power as the world develops in the coming century. So I think we have a great deal of reason to be optimistic about the potential. Against that, we have to look at some of the trends. And I do have to say that it's natural a country with a growing economy, a growing capacity, is going to have a growing military. That's also not 
a, fact, a factor to take on its own as a threat. But let's look for a second at what has happened with China's military. Uh, the 2015 numbers are that the military budget is officially about $145 billion. Uh, unofficial estimates, that is Jane's or Cipri, that take into account other research and development probably put it 35 to 50 percent higher than that, so maybe the 200 million range. So just to give a sense of comparison, we're looking at about three times the size of France or the UK, so fairly large, second largest military in the world after the United States. Um, largest ground forces, largest army, uh, third largest air force, significant navy, significant missile capabilities, growing space capabilities, and certainly, as we all know, very capable cyber capabilities. That is a very big change over a short period of time. If you go back to 1997, the Chinese military budget was about $10 billion. So you're going from about $10 billion to officially $145 billion in an 18-year period. It's a rate of growth that averaged about 15% per year from two, uh, 1998 to 2007. And that is uh, still in excess of double-digit increases, over 10% increase uh, in the current year. As I said, that itself is not necessarily something to be concerned about. It really depends on the role that China plays. And this is where it gets tricky. Because we've had in Asia uh, relative peace and stability in uh, the Pacific for a very long time. Uh, there has been freedom of navigation. I'm sure that will come up a little bit later. Uh, there are many countries with competing territorial claims on islands and on sea territories. But this has all been managed very peacefully until this point. What we've seen is, in parallel with the Chinese increase in military spending, is an increase in assertiveness in the, the way in which China goes about staking its claims to islands and sea space and airspace in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. Uh, this is the change. And uh, while uh, clearly China has these claims, other countries do too, I think it's important to note that no one in the region agrees with these Chinese assertions of the territories of the islands or the sea space, this famous nine-dash line in the South China Sea. Um, China has always argued this. This is not a new position for China. But what's new is asserting the right to that with increasing military presence. And that has the potential to change the balance uh, in Asia in a way that can be destabilizing and could potentially lead to conflict depending on how China goes about that. We've seen land reclamation at an unprecedented rate. We've seen that land reclamation appear to take the form of airstrips, which could be used for military purposes. Uh, I was happening, happened to visit Japan earlier this year. Uh, they reckon about two airspace or sea space incursions per day uh, from China that they have to then go and meet. Uh, you hear the same thing from the Philippines or Vietnam, that they're concerned about the, this growing assertiveness in the way China goes about its, its uh, territorial claims. As I said, there's no particular reason why this has to be so, why it should change the status quo, and I think there's every opportunity to work together with China collaboratively. Uh, we do have a very good military relationship, uh, the United States and China, we also have very good bilateral relations, uh, but it is also important that we take into account the interests of all of the states in uh, East Asia, Southeast Asia, and that we try to preserve the peace and stability that has prevailed for decades uh, since the end of World War II, and basing that on some of the principles of the right to use of international airspace and sea space that has really been um, the precedent for, in the case of sea space, really for centuries. Thank you, Kurt. This was a uh, very balanced view on, from the American side on, on that issue. Uh, now to Colonel Lu Yun. We do see a lot of new weapon platforms. We see uh, in the Chinese aircraft carrier in the region, we do see hypersonic glide missiles. We do see a lot of action happening. Explain us what's happening. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Parson. Thank you, Mr. Kalenios, and thank you, Ambassador uh, Walker. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. 
Um, although I can only speak for myself, uh, I will do my best to explain or make my respected audience know more about China's defense policy and know more about Chinese military. It is, uh, as a general, generally speaking, my position is quite clear. My, posi my position is to argue that China's growing military is not a threat to Asia. My general argument is that a peaceful developing China has varieties of reasons to build a strong military, but it will not pose any threat to any other countries, especially Asian countries. Firstly, the Chinese military needs to develop to deal with its varieties uh, involving security challenges, as well as to get along with the trend of world uh, revolution on military affairs, RMA. China's peaceful development needs the protection from its armed forces. It is an important guarantee um, for maintaining peace and maintaining a uh, managing crisis. Since we are still living in an unsafe world with uh, the presence of unjust, unequal, and unreasonable elements in international relations. To safeguard the interests of China's sovereignty, security, and development, um, and to deal with both traditional and non-traditional threats, China has every reason to develop its military capabilities. On the other hand, all military forces need to develop so as to get along with the trend of world IMA, with China no exception. The Chinese military is at uh, its semi-mechanized um, or mechanized stage of development and is still backward in many aspects. There is still a long way to go for Chinese military to become a modernized force, and it needs to develop so as not to lag behind in the course of global IMA. However, China has maintained the coordinated developing uh, pace of its military as against the economic development, with the economy is also the priority. Our defense budget accounts less than 1.5% of total GDP, while the NATO standard is 2%, and the United States exceed 4%. Secondly, the fundamental task of all armed forces is to contain or stop a war. The best way to fulfill this task is to possess military capability. However, to judge whether a military force poses threat to other countries, the key factor is not the size and the capability of the military force, but the nature of its defense policy and the military strategy that the country adopts. China's modern history was full of traumas and sufferings for more than a century since 1840. China was the victim of colonialism, hegemony, and aggression, with the whole country being invaded and bullied, sovereignty being encroached and violated, and the people being enslaved and slaughtered. What China learns from its own history is the fact that being backward means being vulnerable to attacks. China has a land border of 22,000 kilometers and a coastline of 18,000 kilometers. China is the only big country that still has not achieved national unification, although we are very happy to see recent historic meeting between Chinese President Xi Jinping and the leader of Taiwan region, Ma Ying-jeou, which is a very positive improvement uh, of the cross-strait relationship. Uh, there still exist ta Taiwan separatist forces which remain as the biggest threat to the peaceful development of China. For all those reasons, China needs to enhance its overall military capability. However, to judge whether a military force poses threat to other countries, the key factor is not the size and the capability of the military force, but the nature of its defense policy and the military strategy that the country adopts. A strong military force guided by a non-aggressive policy will not pose any threat, while a small force guided by an aggressive government and defense policy will definitely pose a threat. A case in point is Iraq in 1990s when it invaded Kuwait. Although the Chinese military should always be prepared for the worst scenarios like, like 
or militaries do. Our military strategy is such that Chinese military will not strike, only it is struck. All in all, in Chinese military, we have always been a responsible contributor to world peace and will remain so by developing itself. Thirdly, the Chinese military needs to develop to shoulder more international responsibilities in an era of globalization characterized by interwoven security interests and threats. Not a single country can stand alone to deal with the security issues, and no more country can rise by resorting to military force. So the mission of the Chinese military is to engage in cooperation with all countries so as to take more international responsibilities. Just to name a few, China is the largest contributor to the UN peacekeeping missions among the P5. Since 1990, PLA has dispatched 30,000 soldiers and officers to take part in 24 peacekeeping operations under the framework of UN. Since 2008, Chinese Navy has dispatched 21 task groups for escort and anti-piracy missions, providing escort to over 6,000 ships, with half of which being foreign ships. Therefore, the Chinese military needs to fur further develop to make even more contributions to maintaining the peace, stability, and the prosperity of the Asia-Pacific region, and even that of the whole world. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Both de uh, discussants are, um, are even trying to balance their positive time account, so I see some, some equality here. Kurt, you got the opportunity to rebuttal and to uh, take some of, some of these arguments. Striking for me was sort of the, the nature of defense policy, historical. Right. Which is place well, I th I, uh, let me uh, pick that up and I'll, I'll address four uh, points. One of them is uh, I think um, while it may be true that there is more modernization and development that China would like to do with its military, it has already made extraordinary progress technologically and organizationally and in terms of raw capability. It is a serious military capability today. It's not something out into the future. And the amount of spending on equipment and on personnel reflects that, and it has produced. So I think China can feel good about that. I don't think it, it needs to think it's still got this weak second-rate military. It's actually pretty good. Uh, the second, uh, I do want to pick out one phrase uh, that my colleague here used, which is national unification. China is one of the few examples left of a country that has not achieved national unification. Um, that's a very interesting point to bring up because there are essentially two scenarios where one can imagine China being in a conflict in Asia. Uh, one of them is a dispute with neighboring countries over islands that China claims and they also claim, and I, I mentioned that in my opening. The other is over Taiwan. And while we recognize a single China and a one China policy, as does uh, I'm sure everybody in this room, uh, at the same time, uh, we live with a, a de facto separation and a de facto peace that has been established over a very long period of time. Were that to be challenged uh, by China, directly, uh, I think that could lead to a very serious conflict in Asia. And uh, I think we would all hope that that would be avoided. And we hope that the dialogue with the uh, Taiwanese government continues uh, rather than seeing that through any kind of military lens. Thirdly, uh, I very much appreciate what uh, my colleague here said about self-defense. This gets to your question, Stefan, about uh, military doctrine. The issue with self-defense arises, however, when there are disputes over what constitutes national territory, what constitutes national airspace, what constitutes national sea space. Only China asserts that all of the South China Sea and these islands are Chinese and would therefore assert that other countries taking advantage of what they see as international space or in some cases even their own territory, China could potentially perceive as a threat. And if China were to respond to that militarily, that would also be a source of conflict. Uh, that is something that I think we should be very concerned about as well. And then the final point is to reiterate something I said in my opening, which is that um, most of this is not new. Uh, the competing territorial claims, the competing sea space claims, the uh, 
the uh, presence of the U.S. military, the presence of a Chinese military, the presence of other countries' militaries in the region, none of this is actually new. The one thing that's new, and it's really over the last 20 years, has been the size of China's military and the assertiveness which with, which with it links its military activities to its territorial claims. And uh, just for example, uh, we did have a, a military maritime maneuver where we passed through some of these waters uh, just a few weeks ago. It's uh, something that the United States has done and other nations have done over years and years and years. But now it elicited a much stronger response from China uh, because of this uh, growing assertiveness about these territorial claims. That's where the risk comes from in the future, I think. Thank you. Oh, Yun. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Walker. Um, actually, I, it's frequently raised the questions like the Chinese threat to change the status quo. And uh, I give you some example. Uh, I do not want to argue that China is not the one who changed the status quo, but it's really some proper reaction to the country who changed the status quo first. We have to react on our own territory. Um, such like, uh, I can give you examples, some countries in the South China Sea have been conducting construction on islands and reefs. Uh, maybe for these things, there, are, there have existed such, such kind of things for more than 20 years. For example, Vietnam has expanded the area of those islands and reefs uh, each occupied by over 20,000 square meters. And some of them are already equipped with guns and missiles. So this is a fact, but the whole international society is uh, maybe it's not uh, worth of an emphasis when uh, some country argues that China's island and uh, reefs reclam reclamation is a threat. And uh, the speed issue, I think, for the uh, construction of the islands is also another question uh, to, to be raised as an issue of changing status quo. But I think the speed issue is a matter of uh, quantity rather a quality. Some people accuse China's fast speed of construction, um, but from a logical or legal perspective, the speed does not change the nature of things. Moreover, China should not be over surprised or people from outside should not be over surprised by the faster speed of a Chinese speed. Since the opening up, uh, China has uh, uh, developed from a, a very underdeveloped country to a second uh, world economy. So it uh, only takes 30 years. So I think you are not surprised at Chinese speed. So that's it. Thank you very much um, for those introductory uh, remarks. We are now um, opening this up to you, or to me, if none of you wants to ask questions, but I am happy to take in the first ones. I guess we should have microphones going around. Let's start here in the front and then work our way over. We probably collect two or three at a time and then go back and forth. To both, but first of all to China, representative. Is China ready? to address the International Court of Justice to decide through ruling of this court your some questionable que uh, relationship on territorial delimitation in seas. And what position of the United States on this topic? Thank you very much. This was the question about uh, the international legal framework, which is hotly impo highly important. Right in the back here, second question, please. Hello, uh, I'm Gohar Gilani, and my question is to Colonel. <laughs> um, uh, does China see a role for itself uh, in resolving disputes like Kashmir in the region and pressurize India for the growing climate of intolerance? 
uh, in case of recent incidents of mob lynching people who eat beef or there's a suspicion that they have eaten beef if China sees a larger role for itself in the Asian region. Thank you. Uh, I, be I beg your pardon. What's your question? My question is, does China see a role for itself in resolving disputes like Kashmir between India and Pakistan? Okay. Thank you. Okay. You see about the influence in, on the wider uh, Southeast Asian continent. And one more question, Stefan. Stefan Bierling, University of Regensburg. Uh, John Boehner, the last speaker of the House of Representatives, once said, a leader without followers is just a man taking a walk. Is China just taking a walk? <laughs> Who are your best friends? Who are you supported by in international relations besides North Korea? Thank you very much. I guess we could have got it. We first, uh, I'll come back to you later. We uh, answer the first round now, please. You want to take the first questions? Uh, I just uh, take uh, the three no, questions, or, or one by one, or I just read Those for... who were addressed to you, if you want okay. to answer them. Uh, it's, uh, all of the questions are good questions, and uh, the first one is about uh, why China do not accept the uh, International Court of Justice. I think the, yes, you're right, the international judicial institutions such as the International Court of Justice and the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea can also serve as a third party arbitrator. But only after no settlement has been reached through peaceful means and the parties concerned agree to accept the arbitration. As early as 2006, China informed the United Nations in a statement that it wouldn't accept arbitration on territorial sovereignty, maritime demarcation, and military activities under Article 298 of UNCLOS. It is also the legitimate procedure of UNCLOS. And, uh, even for the Philippines, I don't think that the Philippines has exhausted all the possibilities to consult with China on the territorial issues. Taking one example, in 2014, uh, the Philippines has just reached its first maritime boundary treaty with Indonesia. It takes 20 years of negotiations between these two countries, so it's a firm evidence that the Philippines has not exhausted all the dipl diplomatic venues. And at least, as far as I know, in 2010, uh, China made the proposal to the Philippines government on establish, uh, establishing a bilateral mechanism, uh, mechanisms of regular consultations on the maritime issues. And in 2011 and 2012, China proposed to restart the uh, mechanism of confidence building measures between our two countries. So without consulting with the ASEAN countries in which the Philippines is a member, the Philippines government took China to arbitration. This is a really a unilateral proceeding, also caught ASEAN countries by surprise. So I think it's not a very wise way for the Philippines government to uh, resolve the problem in this way. And uh, uh, for the Chinese government's reaction, I think it's legal, reasonable, and uh, rational. And for other things, uh, it's... Uh, sphere of influence in Southeast Asia and those, the question about followers and, and, al yeah, and natural it's allies. A, it's a South, uh, the, the resolution of South China Sea should be an example of the yeah. uh, territorial disputes between India and the Pakistan. I think, uh, yes, the situation is quite different. But for the policy choice, I think it's a very important way to keep the negotiation channel open to try your best to find a way to talk. Uh, it's not a European way to talk to death, but uh, it's really a good way we can follow to talk, to consult, to get a negotiation, even it's very, it's a very hard way. Uh, this is the only uh, example, I, I think it should be an example, and that is a two-channel uh, approaches or 
dual track approaches for the South China Sea resolution, which has been raised by Chinese government to keep the uh, freedom of navigation and the, uh, the whole peaceful environment of the South China Sea by ASEAN countries and to resolve the disputes bilaterally. So that's a dual track approach. Uh, for the third one, it looks like you are right, but uh, I don't think so. And you can see with the development of Chinese uh, uh, comprehensive national strengths, um, on the one hand, we, it has raised some kind of suspicion about the Chinese threat. But on, on the other, I confident in Chinese soft power. Even we cannot make use of that uh, properly sometimes, or it's uh, also a process that the international society should learn to understand China in an uh, Asian way. So that's my answer. Thank you. Thank you. How about the American way of building alliances? I mean, there hasn't been any shyness from Washington in reaching out to the neighbors recently. The new strategic um, um, paper with um, Tokyo is probably the best example, but also with Vietnam and, and the Philippines, uh, the U.S. is really holding close ties immediately. So is this a kind of ganging up now taking place? Again, I, w I wouldn't refer to it as, as ganging up, and I wouldn't treat this as something new. You know, our alliance with Japan goes back to the settlement after World War II, the same with the Philippines. And what's happened here, and, and I think the exchange that we've just seen illustrates this, where you have China increasingly pushing its own view, which is understandable that that's China's view, but when it is backed up with a stronger military and stronger assertiveness, it gives rise to greater concern on the part of our allies in Asia that have relied on the U.S. to play a role in balancing this and in keeping uh, an open East Asia, an open East South China Sea, East China Sea. So there's a great growing demand from China, I'm sorry, from Japan, from South Korea, from the Philippines for U.S. presence and U.S. engagement. Uh, I want to add, come back to the question that was asked about the ICJ or about territorial disputes. Uh, the United States, I think, quite understandably, doesn't take a specific position on the territorial disputes, but we do have great concerns about the unilateral imposition of a military settlement of those disputes, and that's where we would have our first concern. And the second, if that were to take the form of denying access, free, open access to air and sea space for every other country in the world, including the United States, to exercise navigation rights, that would be of direct concern to the United States as well. And that's where we've, we've placed our position. But anything that would be directly agreed mutually by parties in Asia, I'm sure that we, we, would, um, we would accept or that we would view as a reasonable settlement. But our understanding is that, uh, as the last question indicated, China is not benefiting from the understanding and support of a lot of its neighbors and following China. In fact, there's a growing concern about uh, where things may be headed. Thank you. Let's take the next round. There was Robert Stanzel first and then, uh, yeah, the, the, Herr Stanzel here. Uh, thank you. For a change, I have a question to uh, Mr. Volker. Um, the China needs an army uh, maybe Ms. Lewin may reason that there are unreasonable elements in, national, in international society that think that it's not really enough. I don't see any country really wanting to attack China. So why, is, uh, why do we see the military build up? Maybe it's just that uh, a world power needs a world class army or something of the sort. Uh, secondly, what China is doing in terms of land reclamation, fishermen, combating fishermen, is something that the other actors in the South China Sea also do. Uh, I don't see any risk there. I see the risk that you've referred to only in three areas. The first is that China claims the total, almost the totality of the South China Sea. So here indeed the freedom of navigation may, may be endangered. Secondly, there's Taiwan. There's still more than 1,000 missiles directed at Taiwan and uh, China has not renounced its will to, if need be, reunify with Taiwan 
by the use of force. The third is the air defense identif identification zone that China has directed over uh, territory that is also claimed by Japan and partly by South Korea. So if you look at these three risks, where for you is the threshold that the risk can turn into true combat, into an armed dispute? Where's the moment that maybe the United States Navy would be forced to intervene? Only then, I think, would we really see the threat of the use of uh, armed force. My second question to you is... Oh, this is running out of time, but really fast, please. We have so yes. many more questions. If, in the case of any armed conflict, what do you expect uh, your European allies to do? Thank okay. You. Short enough? <laughs> Very well, thank you. Just uh, in the immediate environment, thank you. Thank you. Um, my question is directed uh, to Col Col Colonel Luyen. Um, you, write, uh, you pointed out that China legitimately availed itself of the pr provision in UNCLOS, allowing it to exclude the, uh, from the jurisdiction of the tribunal any act, uh, matters concerning uh, military activities. Is it China's case that uh, the dispute in the South China Sea is concer uh, does concern its military activities? and therefore is exempt from the jurisdiction of the tribunal? Because China has not been terribly clear about whether the activities it's con in c conducting that is military in nature. Thank you. Thank you. Probably you should pass it on to your neighbor in the... Exactly. Shahid Kamal, uh, my first. question is to Ambassador Woku. Uh, you have expressed um, um, admiration for the economic transformation that has taken place in China. And China is now increasingly engaged in promoting economic stability globally. And I was thinking that the, the moment has come, there's an opportunity to see the growing strength of China, not as a threat, but as an opportunity to promote international peace and stability. And I'd like to have your thoughts on that. Thank you very much. Um, we have so many questions and so little time that I suggest that we take on more questions now and then try to get the answers within the closing uh, statements which we will extend a little bit. So the gentleman here right next to you and then we'll come to the middle those two gentlemen and then we'll see how far we get. My question is uh, for uh, Colonel, Colonel Lu. So um, on which legal basis are China claiming the uh, so, so called nine dash line? So in case of Philippines and Vietnam the um, Splatley and Paracel are rather close from the baseline of the Ch respective countries. But in case of China, they are far beyond from the Hainan Island. So on which legal basis are claiming? This is my question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Those two questions here, gentlemen, the gray shirt, and then to the very front here. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Oh, of course, uh, because I'm from China. So most of the questions goes to um, Ambassador. Yeah, exactly. You mentioned some, uh, <clears throat> you know, especially some details about how the Chinese military uh, expenditure, of course, is not a new argument. But I would like to say maybe firstly, uh, even uh, we, we just according to the number of uh, expenditure, China is still a weaker one. I mean, weaker party in that region if we take account into how large of its uh, expenditure from the United States and also plus Japan. Because as we know, Japan is a very, very you know, big potential uh, with uh, technology and everything. So, secondly, I think that uh, China, because China is a weaker one, so China is still uh, has its um, you know defensive policy on the uh, security issue. And also, I think that uh, now the, maybe the main problem is the lack of uh, mutual trust politically between China and the United States. As I understand, uh, a few years ago, Chinese side. Uh, seek a kind of uh, guarantee of uh, uh, political trust from the United States to look for a kind of framework of uh, partnership, just like what happened now between China and the European country, like that. But it was refused by Washington. And even in recent years, China want to, you know, a kind of uh, another new type of relation between uh, uh, big countries. And also we find that uh, Washington is still reluctant to re accept this kind of uh, principle, non uh, confrontation, non conflict. So, the lack of uh, mutual trust between China and the United States, how could you give the safety to China to s tell China, okay, it's enough for you to stop for any kind of uh, uh, military expenditure growth? Or, just like that gentleman 
uh, confused. Uh, why China uh, still develop its uh, uh, military? Because I think the uh, answer is simple. That uh, China didn't feel uh, safe under the pressure from the United States or Japan like that. Okay, so, thank you. So, Ambassador, yep. my question is, how could you give us a, uh, uh, I mean, the uh, standard for China to say that how much uh, military potential would, would be okay for China? And how could China and the United States get a kind of a mutual trust on this security issue? Thank, thank you. you very much. And the final question is from you, please. Fraser Cameron from Brussels. Firstly, um, Colonel, and let me assure you that talking things to death is very much the European way of doing things. Uh, I learned it from Can you the give Netherlands. us a flavor, though, of the debates within the PLO and between the PLO, L, PLO, uh, PLA and the party on strategic debates? Obviously, the party takes final decisions, but to what extent do you have an input into this discussion? You know, the civil military relationship, a few comments. And Kurt, what would you d do differently if you were in charge of Chinese defense policy? Interesting questions. We really have to cut it short now. I think we are, got a lot of questions in. We ran out of over time. And I would ask both panelists to try to answer questions while making the final argument, if this is possible. Um, I am willing to give you a little bit more time, but um, let's try. You want to go first? Kurt? I'm happy to. Okay. Very good. Um, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the questions. I think the the common thread I would like to draw through these questions and responding to them is that it's important to think of this in the framework of the choices that China makes. Uh, these are not a whole lot of things that are being done to China or being done around China or about China. It's things that China is itself doing. And as a growing economic power, as a growing military power, it has a lot of opportunity and it can choose what paths to take. And that's part of your question about militarily. It's part of your question about economically. What paths does China take? Uh, I would say uh, a couple of things here. Uh, first off, uh, I agree with Volker Stanzel. You, you articulated very clearly the same points that I was making about where the risks are and that the, the risk is that there would be some unilateral action by China militarily to change that. So when you ask where's the risk of conflict and what would the U.S. do? I think the answer is the U.S. is going to continue doing what we have always done, to have a presence in Asia, to exercise that presence throughout uh, international waters and airspace. Uh, I don't see any risk of conflict from that unless China decides to create a conflict from that by some kind of military strike on a uh, U.S. ship or U.S. aircraft or against Japanese or Vietnamese or others. So it's, again, a choice that China uh, could make or hopefully does not make, and that we find other ways of managing a growing China and peace and stability in East Asia over a long period of time without conflict. Uh, secondly, when we talk about the economy, absolutely, it should be a source of uh, growing convergence and cooperation globally. Thus far, that has not been the, uh, uniformly the way China's economic rise has played out. There have been, it has been a mixture. Um, there have been issues of the currency and the evaluation of the currency. There have been issues of uh, competition for resources and state-to-state -state contracts to address resources. Uh, there have been issues of um, trade competition, and certainly we felt, and I know Europe has felt, that we've lost a lot of jobs to China because of China's competitive advantage in manufacturing. So there's a lot of friction in the system here. There is potential if we can continue to work together to support a global, liberal, fair trading order that benefits all countries, uh, then we're very much in favor of that. And, and as you say, it is an opportunity to build uh, growing cooperation stability. It's one that, again, depends on the choices that China makes. As for uh, China being uh, the weaker power in Asia and feeling uh, that it needs to feel safe, I'm not aware, uh, maybe I'm wrong, of threats to China from the United States or from any of the other countries in Asia. No, no one is threatening China. I think it is natural, as was indicated in a question, for a growing power, a, gro a growing country with growing economic potential to have a growing military and to feel that it is able to protect its territory from whatever may arise. That's natural. But I don't believe there's any particular threat there, so there's no reason for China not to feel safe. 
Uh, and when you compare China and Japan, the, the, the scale of China's military spending now is about three times the size of that of Japan. And it is increasingly high-tech and very capable. Uh, so I think this image of China being a weak power may be something the Chinese feel, given the history, but I don't know that it reflects the, re the military reality today. And that is why Japan or South Korea or the Philippines or others uh, rely upon a U.S. presence in Asia to maintain a balance. And finally, if I were in charge of China's defense policy, what would I do differently? I would do two things, and of course these are never going to happen. Uh, I would de-link China's military growth from its uh, contested territorial claims. I'm not suggesting that China would give up on its claims of territory and sea space and airspace, that every country pursues these. We have some territorial disputes, I'm sure, somewhere. Um, but to demilitarize that and not look at that as an area of growing military confrontation. Uh, the other thing I would do is try to provide some reassurance to neighbors uh, through uh, cooperation, joint exercises, uh, participation in larger international efforts where we work towards some common purposes. China's begun to do this. Uh, I, wanna do, I do want to say so and give credit for that, including, as my colleague mentioned, through UN operations. But I think that reassurance to neighbors, because with such a rapidly growing military, it is understandable that uh, China's neighbors do feel increasingly concerned. And everything possible that China could do to provide reassurance would be uh, a, a wise step at this point. And uh, so with that, I think, the, again, to repeat the common thread, it's really the choices that China makes. It, it's not that things are happening to China. It's that China's changing. Its role is changing. And as it changes, uh, it's the really up to Beijing to, to shape the direction that that takes. And if you put yourself back in your American shoes for a second and, and reflect a bit more on the question of trust, which I think is yes. to the core of it, um, what, what, what could be an American offer on, on yeah. that field? I, um, I wonder. Uh, I would not have said that there is a lack of trust. Uh, I think we have a very robust relationship with China. We have a strategic economic dialogue. We have other strategic dialogues. President Xi has invited Ash Carter to visit Beijing. Our PACOM commander was just there at a conference. There's a lot going on. We've done um, military visits uh, with each other. It's not a lack of trust. It is some disagreement about issues. We do disagree on some things, and that's, that's normal. Uh, what we worry about is that that disagreement from the part of China could result in a militarization of that disagreement, which uh, could then bring instability or conflict. That's not a question of trust. That's really managing areas where we disagree among the many areas where we have a very constructive relationship. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lu Yun. Uh, your four minutes and even more if you want. Uh, many questions and the trust <laughs> Thank you. Thing. Thank you, Stephen. And a very quick reaction toward uh, Mr. Walker's remarks. Uh, yes, you're right. Everything is possible for a rising power. So that's why Chinese government must be very confident in its way of peaceful rise. So that's a very quick reaction for your remark. And for the questions raised uh, by the first and the second uh, uh, audience, and uh, I think it's uh, uh, from different angles, you want to ask uh, if uh, the, uh, the freedom of navigation will be influenced uh, by China's reclamation, uh, or you want to talk about the very specific international law issues. And uh, for the very specific and the professional international law problem, I think I'm not, honestly, I'm not an expert of international law, but I've learned from some experts who are uh, searching about the international law. Maybe I can get back to you uh, later. And for the freedom of navigation, I think it's uh, really a pseudo proposition, even with the construction of Chinese islands and reefs. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, 50% of the uh, world's uh, uh, merchant fleets goes through the South China Sea each year, and uh, there's not a single report in which uh, these ships uh, are impeded in the region uh, because of problem associated with the freedom uh, of navigation. The total second point, the total sea area of South China Sea is about 
3.5 million square kilometers and the land area of all those 200 and more islands and reefs only occupy 20 some kilometers. Can you imagine the freedom of navigation be affected? Thirdly, 40% of world maritime cargo and 80% uh, of imported uh, uh, energy resources uh, go through the South China Sea. Since Chinese, uh, China relies heavily on maritime trade or, uh, to grow its economy, China is equally eager uh, for the freedom of navigation throughout the world throughout the world, like other countries, all nations in and out of the region benefit from such kind of freedom. Uh, the Chinese government is, strong, is a strong supporter and the guardian of the freedom of navigation and it will never make a fuss of the issue because such a move is not in line with the fundamental interests of China. Uh, for the, I, I want to give a very short uh, remark on the Maybe the the recent case of Lassen uh, warship. Uh, I have to mention that because um, one of the uh, purpose of the construction of the Chinese uh, islands and reefs uh, of the Nanshan Islands is to provide navigation assistance, such as light towers, something else, which is conducive to the freedom of navigation in the South China Sea, but U.S. Navy ships have deviated from those commonly used sea lanes of communication and, navi and uh, navigated to the areas close to those islands and reefs manned by China. Uh, this can only be interpreted as a military provocation to China. So. Uh, from my perspective, I think the U.S. government should emphasize the smart, po smart power very much. I think it's not a smart approach. So for the 9 dash line, uh, I will uh, recommend a very professional article to you after this speech uh, on the uh, explanation of the light dash line. And uh, basically, I can give an explanation. At least uh, the light dash line have uh, exist for more than 60 years. So I don't think the historic right and the historic uh, title are not a part of international law. And for the male-to-male -male relationship or cooperation, that's a very good and positive question. Uh, I think it also, uh, uh, it's also relating to the mutual trust or confidence building measures, although uh, from the Asian perspective, confidence buildings is uh, some kind of experience from European countries. In Asian countries, we have not such kind of mechanized institution. We need to build mutual trust and, and uh, uh, at the initial uh, step. But uh, uh, what, what's, uh, the, uh, what's the way to realize the mutual trust building? Uh, I think the male-to-male -male relationship uh, under uh, bilaterally or multilaterally uh, are the very good way to realize it. Under the, uh, taking the bilateral one as an example, Chinese military has uh, more than 20 uh, uh, consultation channels with uh, different countries and uh, with more than uh, with more than 20 different countries sorry we have the uh, defense consultation uh, channels and we also have bilateral and multilateral military exercises in a very practical sense and uh, under the ARF framework, uh, we call it uh, ADMM plus, uh, 10 ASEAN countries plus uh, the other eight countries. We have very uh, practical uh, cooperation uh, among different countries. So I think uh, it's the specific way to build trust uh, between or among militaries. And it's also the way to get understanding between and among different countries from the security and the military level. So that's something I myself uh, try to do uh, my best to promote. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you indeed did. Um, I want to 
uh, probably um, refer you to the gentleman about the question of internal dealings within the uh, uh, PLA uh, and uh, within their uh, party committees. Uh, so you, you solve that on their, in the hallways. Um, I'd love to hear it from here, but I appreciate it because this is one of the rare occasions where we have a Chinese-American debate on a Berlin public stage, and this is quite a first, uh, to be honest, for me. And uh, so thank you for both of you to do this. Um, I think we're going to have a break. We should do this in the spirit of Helmut Schmidt, who, with Deng Xiaoping, went for a smoke. <laughs>